Over the past few years, everything has changed. Where and how we work and live, the way we collaborate and measure success, and the emerging technologies we use to get it all done. Welcome to The Bridge. Join our host, Scott Kinkin, in a series of discussions with top leaders in technology and learn about how they bridge their lives and their businesses into our new hybrid work and AI-driven reality. Our hope is that the insights and experiences will help you on your journey in business and in life from who we were to who we are today. And maybe it'll help you get better prepared for whatever comes next. The Bridge is a service of Bridgepoint Technologies, the nation's leading IT advisory firm. Bridgepoint helps business leaders evaluate, procure, implement and manage technology and customer experience solutions with a focus on realizing sustainable results for your business growth. And now, here's your host, Scott Kinka. In business, we have lots of sources of data, and we're in the practice of considering the way we interact with data and determining our system of record. It's how we've solved for these islands of information. But in our new hybrid work reality, we haven't really figured out what our communications strategy is yet. Most businesses of all sizes today have multiple collaboration tools that do similar things, some better than others, of course. And most businesses are content to allow users to just figure it out. Chat here, video meeting there, file share over here. Hey, why didn't you answer my email in five minutes? Is that even the expectation? Just like we've solved for our islands of information challenge by defining a system of record, maybe it's time we think about our islands of communication problem by defining our system of engagement. My guest on this episode of The Bridge is Graham Geddes. He's a 15-year veteran of Cisco, and since the pandemic, he's been at Zoom, most recently serving as the chief sales and growth officer. He went to work for the company that became synonymous with one of these islands of communication during the pandemic. Graham is now challenging us to think about engagement differently. As IT leaders, isn't it time we think about our communications in the same way we think about our data? If we're challenging you to think differently here on The Bridge, please make sure you give us a follow, a like, or a rating on your favorite podcast platform. But let's get to it. Systems of engagement with Zoom's Graham Geddes on this episode of The Bridge. Well, hi, and welcome to another episode of The Bridge. I'm your host, Scott Kinka, and I am thrilled to be joined on this episode uh, by Graham Geddes. He is the Chief Sales and Growth Officer of Zoom. How are you, Graham? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Um, You know, you've been at Zoom for, I think, like how many years now? Uh, It's it's dog years, so it's four and a half, but I don't know what that counts in technology terms, so. (laughs) Gotcha. In a couple of roles. And I'm going to ask you about that and your history, but we like to just start by getting to know who we're talking to a little bit. So yeah. just tell us about you. What, you know, what do you do? What are you into? Give us a little bit about you personally. Where do you live? Just give us some background. Yeah. So Graham Geddes, uh, Chief Sales and Growth Officer at Zoom, uh, responsible for uh, all of the pre-sales kind of go-to-market activities. So that's you know sales, systems engineering, sales operations, uh, enablement. Uh, enterprise marketing. Uh, so, you know, very, you know, humbled to be leading a, a, a fairly large team here um, at, a, at a very well-known company, Zoom, uh, that, uh, you know, has a, a tremendous, you know, opportunity with our customers. Uh, from a personal perspective, uh, married, you know, father of three, uh, based in Southern California. So I live in uh, Orange County, Elisa Viejo. And, uh, but uh, uh, as with the role, you know, travel quite a bit and get uh, the opportunity to visit, you uh, some very uh, unique and interesting parts of the globe. Yeah. Um, you, you, in your explanation of Zoom, you share there, you're like, you know, with a, with a very large, well-known company, you spent a lot of your career at another very well-known large <laughs> company before that. Uh, and I believe we ran into each other a couple of times there. You know, most of our listeners know a little bit of my history, but you were at Cisco for quite a long time. Tell us about what you did there and we'll kind of bring that over into the Zoom, ex- the recent Zoom experience, but start at Cisco. Yeah, so I, I spent uh, the, the better part of uh, 15, uh, 16 years at Cisco, uh, and it was, uh, I mean, it was just an amazing experience. So uh, kind of think, you know, the post dot com crash uh, and um, the, the story I like to tell is, um, you know, uh, uh, speaking with my parents, uh, you know, joining a new company, um, they asked the question of uh, for, first, they, they thought it was Cisco, the food truck company. 
so the SYSCO. Uh, and after I explained, no, it's the internet company, the one that I'll, I'll forever hold against uh, uh, my mother. She's, she said, well, well, isn't the internet a fad? Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, when I, when I said that I was going to be able to go and, and learn about this new kind of networking technology, everything that we had done through the 90s. Um, so it was just a, a, a very transformative time. Uh, and uh, if we go back to what technology or technologically was happening at the time, it was really around um, the early days of VoIP, right? Voice over IP. Uh, and so it was, um, you know, communications were happening over legacy technologies. And we were sitting there prognosticating that in the future, someday, uh, communications was going to, there was going to be more traffic happening over the internet uh, than other. Uh, and I remember sitting down with customers talking and having these conversations and they're like, I don't know, you know, it's never going to happen. Uh, and it's amazing to see, you know, how far we've come as an industry and where we are now. So uh, the whole time through that uh, really focused around collaboration and kind of the evolution. Uh, so back in those days, you know, it was kind of you know, unified communications. Uh, and then, you know, all of those lessons learned have really kind of pulled through throughout my career uh, and, and kind of informed a lot of what we've done at Zoom. Got it. And you can, when you originally came over into Zoom, if I recall, you know, you came in, you came in having come from Cisco focusing around the Zoom phone addition to the platform, right? Yeah. So I, I came originally, uh, if you can think of it, this is pre pandemic. Uh, so it seems like uh, many moons ago now. Yeah. There, a lot has happened since. <laughs> um, but even then, uh, you know, really, you know, this, you know, understanding that the needs of our customers uh, was more than just the video use case that Zoom at that time was known for and even you know, kind of better known for now. Uh, and you know, expanding our, our customers, they had moved their video workloads to the cloud. I mean, video is tough, right? It's you know, CPU intens intensive, bandwidth intensive. You know, they had moved off of their on-prem video gear and into the cloud. Um, but they were saying, why do I still have my premise PBX? Why do I still have to have all these other technologies? And so um, you know, it was a huge opportunity to, to go and help push the industry forward. Uh, and so joined as kind of the first think at VPGM uh, to build that business from zero. Uh, and over the past five years, I'm you know, very happy with the success we've had in the market, really helping kind of push customers uh, into that cloud journey. Yeah, I do want to revisit that your, your commentary about video in a couple of minutes, but let's stick with you for a minute. I just find it so funny because I think the only thing that actually came true from back to the future is that we would be having most of our conversations, uh, in the 2020s and beyond over video, but we'll come back to that one in a minute. I, I um, predate, so, so I, I laugh at looking at like the Jetsons, right? Where yeah. they're you know, talking to, to TV. So, yeah, we don't. We're not doing all of our running on a treadmill on a building in the sky with our robot maid, but we are definitely talking to everybody over video, oftentimes for more. Not life. yet, at least. Yeah, right. <laughs> not yet, at least. Well, the treadmill conversation is good. I don't even think those existed then. So they got a couple things right on the Jetsons. Yeah. Um, just wrapping up with you real quick. Two more questions. One, um, I like to ask this at the end of the conversation. I'm going to ask it at the beginning, given the conversation we just had. Um, do you have a, a favorite kind of business book or technology book, or maybe something you're reading right now you'd like to share with our listeners that they should check out? Uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, I actually have a, I had a great opportunity. So uh, one of my best uh, or favorite business books. Uh, so I like Simon, Simon Sinek uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, so everything from start with why leaders eat last. Uh, and we had the opportunity to invite and welcome Simon to come and speak with the team. Uh, in uh, this past awesome. summer. Uh, so it was just an amazing opportunity uh, to have a conversation similar to this um, and, and really, you know, kind of tease out some of the, the thinking behind the books. Uh, and so those have been really transformative for me uh, as a leader. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I definitely you know, kind of hold that, um, you know, kind of in high regard. Um, I'm reading the crux right now. I'm forgetting who it's by. It's a, it's a strategy book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's been pretty eye-opening. So it's been really great to see. So uh, uh, that's the one that I'm, I'm currently reading. Perfect. Well, we'll look them up. Get, we'll look up the crux and get it in the notes. I'm a huge Snake fan as well. I'm a follower. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Simon, like if, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, just li literally look him up and follow him now because like the daily nuggets from his talks are really just, I, I feel like they're transformative for business executives, particularly in technology. Um, so a great listen. And it gives me a little bit of perspective 
kind of on your market approach. I think like he's very direct, you know, super interesting, but there's some great, there's some great goodies, uh, uh, goodies there. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot you can te tease out, right? There's a lot around human psychology. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, I wasn't a computer science major in, in college. I yeah. was actually a psychology major. Yeah. So uh, I think there's a lot that we, uh, you know, we get along there. Um, and I think it's, you know, first principle starting, you know, the whole concept is starting with why is kind of what's true north and how do you, what's that intrinsic motivator? Uh, yeah. So I, I think there's, there's a lot, a lot there that, that uh, people would enjoy. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big, people have, we've gotten into this conversation with a lot of our guests and I always talk about, you know, the, like everything written around emotional intelligence is something I follow. I'm a big fan of the emotional intelligence quick book. And I think, you know, that's why I think it's one of the reasons why I love Senate because it's generally like, just put yourself aside for a moment and start with the other person's motivation. Like if you can't get to the big idea or you start with selling, just stop because you're not going to be successful. And I, I, it's a lot of the story I think that we're going to get into over the next couple of minutes. So we'll save some of that, but I want to ask you a question. Um, yeah. You know, if I were to say to you, if we were just, this is an interview. Well, this is an interview, obviously, but I mean, it's a little bit more conversational. Um, as a business executive, what's your superpower? Uh, I, I would actually say it's probably the EQ part. Um, yeah. So um, I, think, I think it's something that can be learned. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really, you know, a, a skill or a muscle that you can develop. But I also do think there, there are some people that, you know, just have, kind of an innate ability or just, um, yeah. you know, care more about it. And so I've always really been fascinated with human psychology. As I mentioned, I studied it in, yeah. in, in college up until the point when you, when you graduate and you say, you know, oh crap, what am I actually going to do? <laughs> um, so I, I didn't actually want to be a shrink. Um, so that was uh, a, a, yeah. a topic for another day, but, uh, but I would say from a superpower as a leader, as a, you know, as an, you know, kind of running an organization, I, I think there's so many parts where EQ pull, you can pull in. Um, and just really, you know, aligning yourself around, you know, other people's perspective. Um, you know, the comment you know, that I always tell my team is, you know, the other person's reality is their reality, meaning it doesn't matter what you think, yeah. right? It's, it's all, you know, it's all based in their perception of reality. And so, um, you know, I think coming at it from that lens, uh, especially as a leader is tremendously helpful and kind of helps me in, in a lot of what I do. Yeah. And it's an interesting segue. I mean, I think for, you know, we, I'm sure we have many folks who are going to be listening to this or who are listening to it now who know Zoom the platform, right? And we'll have an opportunity to talk about that. But I think for those of, of, of the listeners out there who kind of know Zoom as the, the word that became verb in the pandemic, right? Yeah. <laughs> Largely around video. Um, could you just give us, you know, it's not a commercial so much, but I mean, can you give us the way you describe the company today? from, you know, in terms of what it is now, post pandemic, the way you think about it, the way you describe it. Yeah, I think you use the perfect word there. Um, you, you use the term platform. Um, and what I would say is, um, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges that I've had, you know, being in this industry for over 25 years is, you know, we've transformed so many different ways that we communicate, whether it be, you know, text messaging, chat messaging, uh, video, voice, uh, you name it. Um, but really this promise around unified communications, um, you know, I think it was back as a marketing term came out in 2006, 2007. I don't yeah. want to date myself too much here. Um, but this promise of unified communications, we've had it for forever, um, but we truly haven't unlocked that. And I think that's the part um, that I'm, I'm so proud of the work that we do at Zoom. It truly is, you know, a full communications platform that ties together all of these different modalities for the way that we communicate and get work done, not just in your, you know, your professional life, but even your personal life right? and, and pulling all of that together in a single platform. And so it's just amazing to see the value that we can unlock for our customers and even our customers, customers, I'm sure we'll get into things like, you know, customer care and contact center as well. Um, you know, when you have this kind of clean sheet of paper approach, uh, to pull all of these different kind of methods of collaborating together. Yeah. The Weird question, but did the, is the, did the pandemic give us the clean sheet of paper to restart these conversations? Because it felt like it was going to be a 10 year business transformation. And, you know, I can tell you from my seat, you know, I, I, for those who aren't familiar, although I think many of our listeners are, you know, I was a founder and CTO of a unified communications company called Evolve IP, you know, at, at one point, it's a business I haven't been involved in for a few years now, but, um, 
you know, worked with Cisco or was a Cisco customer. I think that's probably where you and I likely first ran into each other. But I mean, we were claiming every year from, you know, probably 2010 until the pandemic was going to be the year of video. Right. And then all of a sudden, like, just, I guess, out of necessity, we jumped the shark and then that became the baseline measure and we started moving into the rest. Like, how do you, how do you think about the current state of collaboration? I guess is sort of where we're at. Are we there? You know, did the pandemic at least get video as the baseline and now we're adding the rest? Just, you know, where, where are we as a work community in terms of getting, you know, the future of collaboration, right? Or at least yeah, adopting think the things we have, I should say. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start by saying I was probably one of those, you know, that was back in the, the 2010s saying, you know, this is the year of video. And then the next year is like, <laughs> no, next year is the year of video. Right. Um, and what I'll say is it's a couple of things. It's yeah. really the intersectionality between the technology and also, you know, kind of the, 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 the people element. Um, around, you know, the readiness to adopt, you know, just because you make a great technology doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that, uh, that the end users will adopt. Um, and I think, you know, really what the pandemic was, was it was an inflection point where we had the right technology and the, the human, you know, need uh, for that technology was, you know, kind of at a, at a heightened level, you know, that we'd never seen before. And, you know, I think that the thing that's important is I don't think there's any going back. Um, and one of the things that's important there is really democratizing access to this technology. So if mm -hmm. you if you go back to those days where we were saying that this is the year of video, well, it was still really expensive. You know, there were expensive room systems on a per user per month basis. You know, it's fifty dollars a seat, um, and you know you didn't have kind of those value economics to really unleash the potential. Um, and thinking that you know the addressable market was so much bigger than what everybody else had thought through. Um, and I think this is what's unique about Zoom is, you know, our really our vision for the market, even from the very early days was, you know, that this is a technology that everybody on the planet could use um, and really use to improve their lives. So, um, you know, I think it's it's having the right technology. We built the architecture to support that future state. Uh, and then when you look at kind of that change agent that happened, um, you know, I think, you know, going from, you know, people joining audio bridges, you know, kind of that never turning on their video to, to now, um, you know, I don't know that I would go to a company if, you know, I can't meet with my colleagues that, you know, are at uh, other locations, right. Without having uh, kind of a, a video platform. Yeah. So, so pandemic happens, we sort of jump the adoption curve. You said two things, having the tech and then adopting the tech. So we hop the adoption curve. Right. And I think in my, in my experience, my opinion would be is that that's sort of the base unit of, it's, that's the base unit of measure even before sort of dial tone is. I mean, most people will send the link before they'll send the phone number, at least in most of my interaction. And I know that there are businesses that are still sort of tied to more traditional telephony, but if we're assuming that at least the go forward is video first, like what are the stories then, you know, I mean, your logo's next to online video meetings in the Webster's dictionary, you know, so like, what are the stories that you're telling or the stories that you're hearing in the field today? Assuming that's the baseline that people are known for, you meet with customers every day. What are the things we're solving now, assuming that the video conversation is at least, you know, partially in the rearview mirror? Yeah, I think it's about how do we connect all of these disparate ways that we're communicating. Uh, so, okay. you know, our customers are looking, you mentioned, right, that some, you know, depending on your, your vertical, your use case, you know, uh, they're, they're, they might be heavy frontline worker base, retail, healthcare, manufacturing. Um, so how do we blend these worlds between, you know, those that are predominantly, um, you know, telephony, uh, those that, are, that have the you know, ability to be video into, you know, how do we actually enable the business to get things done? So whether yeah. you're, you're a, a marketer where you're trying to get your brand out, whether you're a salesperson where you're trying to get a hold of your customers, whether you're a customer support agent trying to interact with your customers and you know, kind of make sure that you're, you're surfacing those. And so the conversations now are, you know, how can we deliver a unified platform that ties all of these, what were historically you know, disparate technologies where you had to go and, and pick a best of breed or, you know, an yeah. approach and stitch it together as a, as an IT leader, um, you can now choose a singular platform that can help you, you know, 
know, pull all of these things together. And so that's, that's where there's really that value unlocked. That's where that value realization happens. Uh, and so that's where a lot of our conversations are today. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about that unlock for a minute. And, you know, this won't come as a surprise because I mentioned I might go here in the pre in our pre-show prep. So I'll just throw it out there. But like when you, you know, some of the platforms that people would believe would, would put in the competitive bucket with Zoom, right, are, you know, something else in that pantheon of platform first, right? I would say productivity app first, search first, but they have video options, right? Where you guys video first, obviously an expanding app integration platform, you know, um, obviously the voice and the PBX pieces, you guys are in CX now, the chat components are increasing. Let me ask you one question. How do you guys think about productivity apps? Because I think, you know, I think some people for integration would go, I would, I'll accept a substandard video experience because I've got this other thing in there. Tell me a little bit about, like, if you're unifying everything, how do you guys address you know, the Google apps and the Microsoft Office 365 and like those buckets and sort of bringing them into the platform universe that is Zoom, if somebody were to adopt everything. Yeah, so I would say there's a couple of things. One is, um, you know, productivity apps, right? Everyone has kind of their app du jour. Yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, we believe in customer choice, open ecosystem. So whether it be, you know, that as your foundational metric, it's kind of the bottom of the pyramid, but then plugging in, Right, the opportunity to have really amazing collaboration technologies that build around that, um, you know, that's one approach. Uh, the other is to plug those in to our platform uh, and make, you know, in, in kind of a vice versa model. So yeah. the answer is, is it really depends on the customer use case. Um, you know, it's not an all or nothing. So when it comes to productivity apps, we know, um, you know, that those are key parts of a workflow for our customer. And how do we pull those in, but then add value on top of that? Uh, and so... Um, you know, that's where we see our customers doing it today. I think there's a unique point of differentiation and, and kind of when we're speaking with customers, when you think about, you know, like really as a company, what is the value unlock? What is it that you do? And, you know, it's, it's the way that your employees interact is where the magic happens. Right? Yeah. That's like, that's where, you know, that's where you have competitive differentiation, competitive differentiation versus your competitor. Uh, and so, you know, we believe strongly that productivity apps are really, really important. Um, frankly, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for innova innovation there, right? We haven't really seen, I mean, right. Excel is Excel, right? And, you know, yeah. Sheets is Sheets and it's been the yeah. same for the last, you know, 20 years, you know, Word is like, you know, Lotus one, two, three, right back in the 90s. So it's, yeah. it, it hasn't changed much. So I do think um, that, you know, if we kind of pontificate about the future, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, for these areas to to innovate. But when we look at the tools that our customers are using today, it's about pulling them into the, the system of engagement of how you run your company. Um, and so most Zoom customers are really running their company on Zoom. Uh, you know, that's how their employees are interacting. That's how they're getting their work done. And so we need to make sure that it's really seamless for, for those tools to be used within the ecosystem. So it's, it's not an either or, uh, it can be an and. Yeah. I, I love, I don't want to blow past something that you just said, because, you know, I mean, obviously we, you know, at, at Bridgepoint and, you know, in my history, we talk to people about all kinds of things and system of record is a term that comes up all the time. I, I, I don't want to blow past what you just said around system of engagement. I think the reality of it is it's like, where are we doing the balance, the majority of our work? Um, how does this business operate? And then you sort of, you, you might leverage downstream capabilities within that platform, or you might say, all right, well, this is an area where I think this Apple, you know, I'm going to go over here for CRM and focus on Salesforce, but I'm going to bring it in. And I, you know, my system of, you know, my system of engagement is Salesforce perhaps. And in that model, then I might decide that my, maybe my customer experience solution is driven there and integrated to something else from a telephony perspective, or maybe it's conversely, you're going, all right, it's zoom. And I'm, you know, we're living primarily there. So I've got to drive my CX experience out of that and then integrate downstream with the data that's in Salesforce. So it's really a matter of like the business owner, um, you know, and the business leaders or the CIO in particular. Um, and we talked a little bit about that changing role, which we'll get into in a minute, but like the CIO thinking about sort of the pantheon of activities in the business, how the business operates, how they're prioritized, and then what's the best tool 
to focus on that. So I guess in some cases, you guys are the video component to somebody else's strategy. And in many cases, you're the heads up display for all the work um, and other downstream applications are attached to it. Is that, is that kind of a reasonable way of thinking about it? Yeah, e either one of those. And, and I would just even, you know, to put the point of it is, you know, I think there's a lot of people that have, you know, made their decision or they think about it of like, you know, I've standardized on, you know, AD and group policy, but like, like, but yet the tail's wagging the dog when it comes to where their <laughs> users are spending the majority of their time to get yeah. their work done. And so if there's yeah. a better tool around that system of engagement um, that we can then plug in seamlessly with those other reasons, right? Those other things that you have, um, you know, we, we just need to make sure that we're really thinking from a business lens perspective, you know, how do we get you know, great employee satisfaction? How do we unlock employee productivity? How do we give them the best tools to get their jobs done? Um, and I think when we really go and we talk to our customers and we do the studies, you know, they're spending a lot more time interacting with each other. It's about how do we speed up those engagements? How do we get that project-based work done faster? It's not about, you know, how many hours in a day I'm spending in a spreadsheet, right? That's not yeah. gonna unlock that next wave of productivity for you or your company. Well, there is sort of a, a, at a high level. I mean, when when those things get plugged into Zoom as platform, it presents you the opportunity to sort of see the value of data across, right? So, tell me a little bit. I mean, where are you guys innovating today? Um, you know, kind of around the platform. What's the what's the big effort inside of Zoom today? Yeah, so I I would say um, you know there's a a big focused and concerted effort around AI. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know that, you know, AI is, is bud, buzzword du jour, right? It's kind of that, you know, it's in the zeitgeist. It's, you know, it's very frothy right now. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, what I would say is, is it's really, you know, making sure that we're not just doing technology for technology's sake. It's, it's how do we leverage, even if we put AI as a term aside, right? How do we leverage disruptive, powerful technologies to help augment or, or allow, you know, people to have greater efficiency, right? Uh, drive greater productivity, um, even just delivering delightful experiences. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a lot that we're doing leveraging AI um, across our platform, um, you know, that I think is, is very different than others are doing in the industry. So we talked about, I think, you know, we talked about kind of pre-pandemic and we talked about democratizing access to video. And we've taken the same approach to, to things like AI. Uh, so there are many players in the industry that are thinking of it as kind of that next cash cow that they're going to go and charge for and, and drive up a bit, up, drive up a business. But, you know, we really view it as a technology to enable people to be more productive and you shouldn't have to choose who gets it, who doesn't, right? Yeah. Can we democratize that, you know, that, that technology across the platform? And uh, so we've taken a very differentiated approach. So it's you know, included uh, for all of our customers, you know, in their kind of paid entitlements. And we launched uh, in September, October timeframe, our AI companion. Uh, and it's really just that, right? It's, it's the companion that works alongside you that helps you be more productive. So uh, it's been really transformational for me and how I do my job. Um, the anecdote that I like to share is, you know, I was on a work trip and uh, I was actually in Australia with the team. And mm -hmm. one of the challenges is, you know, when you're traveling for work, you know, the, the job that you have, you know, the work day back home, is still happening, even though, you know, you're on the road yeah. and every meeting that I was, you know, missing that I would be a part of my right, AI companion was building a summary and sending those to me. So I got to see all the notes from my team meetings that I didn't participate in while I slept. So in the morning I reviewed those, I was up to speed and it was the, you know, this was back in October, but it was the first time where I had gone on a trip and I didn't feel like I had missed out. Um, and so we're seeing the impacts of a lot of these AI, uh, parts yeah. of the platform really change, cause us to think and change, um, you know, how we think about, um, you know, kind of things that we've historically done, um, that we, we need to kind of rethink. Yeah. Has that think, I mean, in your experience, has that thinking now become the job of the CIO post pandemic? I mean, I, and I say that it, one thing that our listeners have heard me say a million times is like any job that's owned by everybody is owned by no one. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, yeah. you know, this level of thinking is, is one of those things where you look across the business, you're like, who's supposed to be thinking of the AI applications? Meanwhile, 
you know, the board of directors is like, go do some AI. I don't really know what that means, but okay. Like it was like cloud six, eight years ago, right? I'm going to go get some cloud. I don't know if it makes sense, but I'm, we're going to go do some. Um, like these use cases for AI are not really very often technology use cases, but I don't think the business understands the technology enough to figure out where the business oriented use cases are. Like, where do you see that falling in an organization these days in your mind, Graham? So, I, I mean, I think your comment uh, couldn't be more spot on, right? Yeah. I think there's a lot of conversations right now that are like, go get AI uh, yeah, and it's AI for AI's sake. And I'll tell you, it's, it's a fool's errand um, yeah. because there's really going to be, there isn't value unlock when you think about it that way. Um, and so that's why I said, you know, we have to be really anchored in what are the problems? What are the use cases that we're solving and how do we leverage a powerful technology? And by the way, if it's not AI, great. Like let's use the right tool for the right job, but it's how do we, what are those new use cases that we can solve as a result of some of these powerful technologies? Yeah. Uh, I do think a lot of the onus and the burden to bear is being put on the CIO. And so if you think yeah. about, I mean, it's just amazing to think about the change in expectations of that role. Uh, but it's not anchored there, right? There's a lot of questions when you talk about this around, um, you know, kind of privacy and safety and security. And so it's, it's you know, the CIO playing kind of a, a central role, but it, it really spans across the organization um, for, for really, again, we talk about the technology, but then there's also the adoption. How do I make sure, right, that I'm in a position to, to turn these technologies on and unlock that for my organization? Yeah. I mean, it's super interesting. That's, that's a podcast in and of itself. And I'm sure we'll get an opportunity, you and I, to have that one at some point. We're, we're getting up towards a half hour. So if you don't mind, I'm going to shift to just a couple fun questions um, to, add, to round this off. Um, this has been a great yeah. chat, uh, Graham. I really appreciate your time. Um, so the first one is probably a, uh, you know, it's a good segue from the conversation we were just in. And it might be the same answer, and that's okay. But... I'd love for you to give me, we ask everybody to give us a shameless prediction um, for the next 12 to 18 months. And it doesn't have to be about tech. You know, it could be about your sports team winning a championship or, you know, something don't, political, don't. although we try to stay away from that. Like, but, you know, w give us a, something that's going to happen the next 12 to 18 months. Be as creative and fun and interesting as you can possibly be. Well, well, first and foremost, you you hit a sore spot because you said uh, your your team winning, and so uh, I, I happen to be a diehard uh, 49er fan, and so we've gotten so close, but yet have have have, have not uh, sealed the deal there. So, uh, um, so I I will go out on a limb and say I'm rooting for my team, and and you know hopefully we we have a a, a Super right. Bowl win uh, yep. uh, in this next year. Um, okay, but you know as a tech you know kind of a, a tech person and technologist, um, you know I I am truly you know, passionate about the opportunity that we have. And so maybe just, you know, parking Zoom aside, I think, um, you know, AI said, you know, I think it's, a, a, you know, it's frothy right now. And I think we, over the next year, we will see kind of, you know, kind of the, the calling the herd, so to speak, of really the people who, who have technology that's anchored in customer value. Um, and we're going to come out the other end. And I think we're really, I mean, we're on the cusp of just some very, very transformational use cases for our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I truly do believe, I mean, I've been in the industry over 20 years. We've talked about a lot of things and I truly think that we're at an inflection point where the timing is, is right, where we're going to be able to just un, you know, unlock so much productivity and opportunity. So I, I do think that that happens. I think we get through this kind of inflection point, you know, kind of through the valley of despair and into real life use cases, not AI for AI's sake. You know, I think that probably by the, the tail end of this year, we'll be coming out that that other end. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, other other bold predictions. I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, right, of, uh, you know, I, I think I wanted to be an astronaut when I was seven years old. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, loved seeing, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the Starship launch. And so, uh, you know, hey, you know, I think uh, maybe we'll we'll have a, a su successful launch uh, by the end of the year on that as well. It's been fun to watch. Okay. Well, that's an interesting one. Let me just, let me, let me uh, harken back to something that you said about AI, because I, I, I mean, I agree with you. I think we're, we're definitely in this like guys that like the way you described it. Um, and I, you know, real world applications are happening. You mentioned your your mother earlier uh, and, and saying, hey, this internet thing, is this a fad? So like 
you know, what do you say to the folks like her who are saying similar things around AI or maybe are concerned about, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the end of the world kind of predictions around AI? Like, do you worry? Are there things like what's on your mind related to that around AI? I think we have to, for, for me, I like to anchor uh, around, yeah. you know, kind of history. So, I mean, there was a lot said about uh, the printing press or the industrial revolution or, I mean, so like, so, you know, we've always been one step away from technology, you know, kind of, you know, kind of turning everything on its head. Right. Um, but I do think that in every single example that we've seen thus far, right. So, you know, prior history doesn't predict future results, right. I think that's what most, that's what my, my uh, investment banker tells me. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I do think, right. We, we need to be a, a kind of a student of history. And, and when yeah. we look at every single, you know, inflection point, and if we talk even more in more modern terms, right, you talk yeah. the internet, but it wasn't just the internet, right. You mentioned cloud mobility, right. There's, there's been a lot of these waves and with each one, they've been disruptive, you know, in, in some sense, but then they've also unlocked just, you know, so much, you know, more opportunity. So I think when we look at AI, it's, it's no different. Um, you know, I think, you know, to sit here and kind of say what it would be, I mean, I, I'd love to be able to, to be the one to know exactly where it's going to go. Um, but I do think, um, you know, it is here to stay. I, I, I yeah. think you know, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. I think it is, you know, some people think it's a feature. I actually think it's more kind of uh, transformational than that. Yeah. Um, and so it's going to be fun to see how it plays out over the coming years. Super exciting. Let's, um, Let's let's play uh, uh, doom casting though for a minute here. Like, let's assume that something doesn't. Let the robots take over, um, and one app still works on your phone. Now I'm asking you to be creative. Only one. You just get to choose which one for the end of the world. What is that app? Oh, that's uh, that's a total. So I, what I will tell you is I will just be sitting there lamenting that all the preppers were uh, were more right than I was. So yeah. Just just for a fun fact there, uh, before even, so earlier in my career, I did work for the fire department. Okay. And so I, I do think I have a bag in the garage. I have my go bag, right? So I, I think there's old expired MREs and some fire boots. And so I think we would fare okay. Okay. Um, but as, as, as far as an app on the phone, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I wish, I, I wish there was an Airbnb for, for doomsday bunkers. So, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe I need to go after this podcast and, and download that, um, but if the world's truly any, I, I would say, you know, probably like, I don't know if the internet or connectivity would even work. So, uh, you know, I would say it's probably just uh, my, my photo uh, app and, uh, and kind of, you know, uh, you know, reflect on all the things that you know, we have to be grateful for before yeah. the, the, the world calamity collides. Yeah, the, I, I like that. Uh, we've had all kinds of interesting answers to that. So I think you're the first person, though, who said photo. You're like, I'm just going to hunker down with my doomsday bag and look at my previous life. <laughs> That's it. Which I love. Graham, that was super interesting and super fun. Um, one of these days, my Gene and I, Gene's a producer, folks know who he is. Like we, we're going to figure out what to do with all these funny answers. But um, I maybe we'll just compile a book. Tech executives talk about the end of the world. I'm not really sure how we're going to do that, but it'll be fun. Um, yeah, I, Graham, I, this, I, was, I, um, this was a spirited 35 minutes, and I hope that our listeners feel the same way. I'm really thrilled that you, uh, you joined us here on The Bridge Podcast. Thanks for your time. No, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Awesome. Fantastic. And, and for more of this insight, please give us a follow or a like on Spotify or Apple or YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Super excited that you spent the last 35 minutes of your life with us. And um, hopefully it was as entertaining for all of you out there in listener land as it was for us. We'll see you soon on another episode of The Bridge. Listen, if you made it this far, there must have been some good content or you're just a fan or a relative of mine. In either case, we appreciate you spending your most valuable asset with us, your time. We don't take that lightly. We'd also like to say one more time that we're appreciative of Bridgepoint Technologies and their belief and sponsorship of this show. We hope that if you or someone you know is thinking about your company's digital transformation or simply the next IT project that you may not have the resources, budget, or time to get to, I'm sure that Bridgepoint, one of the country's fastest growing technology advisory and procurement firms can help. Check out bridgepointtechnologies.com. Don't forget the E on Bridgepoint. Or simply reach out to me at skinka, S-K-I-N-K-A, -K -K at bpt3.net. Also take a minute, please, if you would, to give us a five-star review on your favorite platform. It helps give us the visibility to reach other people like you. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bridge. I'm Scott Kinka, and until next time, there's a lot of noise out there in business and in life. Do what you can to be the signal. Thanks. Thanks.